Thanks very much for the invitation to be here. It's, uh, uh, it's very fun to have a chance to tell you about some of the work that we've been doing in, in Superbugs. Uh, first slide, then, is a um, uh, high-resolution um, image of Staphylococcus aureus, which is a uh, bacterium um, about a couple of microns across. This is a highly magnified image that, uh, as you can see, sort of likes to hang out in clusters. Uh, this organism is uh, in and on uh, many of our bodies and, and, uh, and even in healthy individuals, uh, but, uh, but can, of course, also cause disease. Uh, it can cause things as simple as pimples or boils, um, but in, in uh, life-threatening circumstances, uh, it's uh, responsible for diseases um, of the respiratory system, for example, pneumonia. Um, and can also cause uh, bloodborne infections that are quite dangerous. In the instance when Staphylococcus aureus is resistant to drugs um, such as methicillin, which is a penicillin-like antibiotic, uh, the uh, circumstances can become much more grave. And um, this organism is known uh, both in the scientific and in the lay press as MRSA. So begin here uh, with, a, with a kind of a case study um, this is the study of uh, Boone Baker, a strapping uh, six foot two, uh, 16 year old wide receiver um, from Texas who um, uh, participates in a, in a Friday night uh, football game uh, in October some years ago um, and comes down after turf burn with a purplish boil uh, uh, that um, uh, a doctor drains uh, and prescribes an antibiotic called Septrophore. Um, and, uh, and Boone is cleared to play some, uh, some 10 days later. He, um, he's then, a couple of months later, um, taken into the emergency uh, room and uh, complaining of flu-like symptoms, uh, a terrible aching back, um, and, um, and has regular breathing, has flu-like symptoms. Uh, the, before long, Boone Baker is in the ICU, uh, diagnosed with a methicillin-resistant Staph aureus infection, MRSA. Uh, pustules all over his body. He is dying despite massive doses of, uh, of antibiotics. The, um, uh, ultimately, he is put into the MRI and they discover two baseball-sized abscesses uh, at the base of his spine. Um, uh, these are removed by surgery. He's prescribed more antibiotics and he's starting to feel better. Um, some days later, the breathing tube that has been helping him breathe uh, while he's been in the ICU is removed, and he tells his mother that he can't see out of one of his eyes. Uh, more antibiotics, uh, hourly dosing of those to save that eye, additional surgery ultimately to, uh, to address um, a lung infection, uh, and Boone Baker has been three weeks in the ICU, uh, months at home on IV antibiotics, 41 pounds lighter, and, uh, and is finally cured. So the moral of this story really is that um, despite the, avail the ready availability of antibiotics, um, we're seeing, seeing more and more cases uh, like Boone Baker. That's anecdote. This is data. And one of the best data repositories we have about uh, antibiotic-resistant bacteria is that that is done by the Centers for Disease Control uh, in the United States. Uh, and this graph shows the incidence of antibiotic resistance uh, among pathogenic bacteria that are isolated from patients from intensive care units in hospitals in the United States. And so what we see is a, um, um, quite a, uh, uh, a scary uh, increase. For example, the, the blue line here is that of MRSA uh, over a period of about 20 years where the incidence of MRSA goes from zero uh, in the early 80s to, um, to more than 50% uh, in the, uh, the mid-2000s. Similarly, we have a couple of other organisms there of, of note, vancomycin-resistant enterococcus, uh, fluoroquinolone-resistance, Pseudomonas, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, um, where we're seeing a, a similar um, and concerning increase in uh, drug resistance in these pathogens. That sort of um, uh, pessimism or concern about, about antibiotics is really in stark contrast um, to the kind of optimism uh, that happened with the discovery of antibiotics that, that happened really around um, the Second World War. Um, this is some wartime propaganda, allied propaganda of the day 
that shows a U.S. Army medic uh, treating a wounded, surgy, uh, a, wound, a wounded soldier. Pardon me. Um, and of course, the caption here is that thanks to penicillin, uh, he will come home. The, uh, this poster also pictures some magnified bacteria. Um, it was an unprecedented collaboration of three uh, different pharmaceutical companies, Merck, uh, Pfizer, and Squibb, in the day to provide enough penicillin so that every soldier, allied soldier, that was wounded in the D-Day invasion of Normandy um, could be treated with penicillin. Uh, and so uh, these were heady days. Uh, the discovery of antibiotics it changed everything in terms of medicine, the ability to do everything from treat battle wounds um, uh, to use antibiotics routinely in surgery, um, for immunocompromised patients, that's very common today, uh, and um, really changed our world, I think, in ways that, that we don't appreciate on a daily basis. In that context, the history of antibiotic development is quite informative. Um, um, before the 1930s, there was no such thing as an antibiotic, and people die, died of common infections uh, by bacteria. But you have the discovery in the 30s and 40s of sulfa drugs and beta-lactams, the latter are the chemical class that's penicillin. Uh, and these really changed everything. They kicked off uh, about a two decade long era referred to as the golden age of antibiotic drug discovery um, that, um, that ends in the early 60s. And then what ensues is a remarkable uh, stagnation uh, in innovation in terms of antibiotic drug discovery uh, and research. I started my independent research career uh, in 1995 in the pharmaceutical company uh, in, Bo in the Boston area and uh, moved my laboratory to here at McMaster in 1998 and we have been concerned uh, ever since with um, this problem of a lack of innovation in antibacterial development. So if, if, if hope and promise kind of were the words of the day uh, in, the, uh, in the early 40s in terms of the discovery of penicillin, its utility on the battlefield and so on, complacency has to be the word that describes um, what ensues post-1960. Um, a couple of interesting quotes, Time Magazine, February 1966. Experts agree that by the year 2000, viral and bacterial diseases will have been eradicated. I mean, remarkable quote of the day. In 1969, the U.S. Surgeon General appeared before Congress and testified that it was time to close the book uh, on infectious diseases. Um, HIV AIDS, of course, would ensue about 15 years later, and begin to ravage populations. By the mid middle of, uh, of 1980s, uh, most of the pharmaceutical companies in the world had more or less closed um, their, uh, their efforts in the area of, uh, of anti-infective research. Uh, and what we have in the meantime is a kind of a reckless use of antibiotics that's also fueled by uh, complacency, I would argue, um, prescriptions for um, conditions that are not um, diseases that have to do with bacteria. Uh, and probably one of the most important things is, is literally tens of millions of pounds um, of uh, antibiotics that are used uh, in animal husbandry. Um, we know that antibiotic use correlates with resistance, um, and so there's the reckless nature of, uh, of their use. This particular issue of Time magazine appeared uh, in September of 1994. I'm a postdoc at the time. Um, at Harvard Medical School in Boston. Um, and it was the first uh, sort of call to arms that really certainly caught my attention in the lay press. Uh, and we've seen a lot of this um, in, the, in nearly two decades since then. Uh, this issue of time really focused on MRSA uh, that was in, um, uh, in hospitals. Um, and uh, since then, of course, we'd see a, a great deal uh, more problems, for example, with MRSA entering the community in the case of the Boone Baker story, um, and the entrance of, of new bacterial pathogens that are causing a um, tremendous amount of trouble in the community and the clinic. Uh, and it's um, remarkable to me that, that we've seen these sorts of uh, calls to arms in the lay press for about 20 years, and things are arguably much worse now than they were in 1994. So what is drug resistance? This is a, a slide that's a kind of a cartoon um, of a bacterium. Uh, it shows uh, a plasmid in the middle of this bacterium. That's a, that's a, a piece of genetic material, a circle, um, that encodes uh, the machinery for drug resistance. Um, so in the green area, we have that, that plasmid, a gene on that plasmid, giving rise um, to an antibiotic efflux pump, 
uh, it is pumping the red antibiotic out of the cell as fast as it comes in, um, a sort of a genius mechanism for avoiding uh, and preventing an antibiotic from entering the cell and doing its business. Uh, light purple arrow here um, leads to an antibiotic degrading enzyme. This is a protein machine that can chop up into bits uh, an antibiotic, rendering it useless. And in the third instance, a yellow arrow is leading from a drug resistance gene to a machine, an enzyme that alters um, antibiotic by adding additional atoms and functionality um, to that antibiotic that render it useless. And so one of the most important features of antibiotic drug resistance is that resistance is encoded in DNA that resides on things like plasmids um, that are quite mobile and can be passed from one organism to another. And if you think, for example, about the human body and someone taking antibiotics, you have more bacterial cells in and on your body than you do have human cells. And so, of course, there's a remarkable opportunity for these creatures to share genetic material, um, select for, and pass resistance genes on one to another. So what are the solutions, then, to uh, antibiotic drug resistance? Well, surely good stewardship is one of those. We need more responsible use of antibiotics. We need to be prescribing antibiotics uh, in the clinics and in the community um, only in situations where patients actually have bacterial infections. And we really need to give this animal husbandry agricultural problem um, a big think, and there's not a lot of progress being, being made on the latter. Um, because, of course, resistance that it's, it, that's in the environment we know can be passed uh, into humans. Uh, my research group at McMaster um, has been thinking a lot about um, doing very basic studies, honestly, um, on, on the way bacteria live and survive. And so a greater understanding of those concepts then um, we believe can lead to new strategies um, that would result in new drugs. But I want to finish off here today just telling you a little bit about a strategy that we've turned to more recently, which is this idea about res reversing resistance. If we have an antibiotic um, that is um, not getting the job done on account of resistance in a resistant organism, and we could combine that now with another drug um, that would disable resistance mechanisms, then we might have a unique uh, an effective combination of drugs. And so in that context, we're looking um, at, as this slide suggests, not congruous combinations. So combinations of antibiotic and antibiotic are actually very common. They're an afterthought to antibiotic drug discovery and often um, done a little bit out of desperation. That is, if, if something won't die with one antibiotic, keep adding more in hopes that it will get the job done. Um, we're talking instead not about an afterthought to drug discovery, but something to design in to the drug discovery process in order to beat resistance. Uh, and in this context, these are called syncretic drug, drug combinations. So you have an antibiotic that, um, uh, that would uh, normally kill an organism, but in the case of a resistant organism, we add another drug now that can deal with that resistance mechanism. So an antibiotic plus a non-antibiotic. We're also interested in existing drugs. Um, it's well known that drugs often have cryptic activities. Uh, aspirin is a great example. It's been used uh, as a pain reliever for many, many years before it was discovered, for example, um, that aspirin can have a great uh, benefit in, in heart health. Uh, and it's been used uh, a great deal for that, arguably more now um, than it is used for pain relief. And so we're intrigued with this, this idea that we may find cryptic activities in known drugs that would help us disable resi resistance mechanisms. Um, and then in a case of a known drug, the hurdles to getting um, that chemical entity to the clinic might be much lower. And so this is one of the first experiments, in fact, that we did um, with this in mind. We had a hunch that this would work, but it, it, things really worked out much better than we, we, um, we imagined, honestly. So we begin with the premise of trying to kill a multi-drug resistant organism, in this case, Pseudomonas aeruginosa a troublesome bacterium uh, in the, uh, uh, in, largely in hospital settings, immunocompromised patients, burn patients, um, but also for cystic fibrosis patients, which have a, trouble with colonization of this organism in their lungs. Low doses of tetracycline now systematically combined uh, with a collection that we've assembled of about 1,000 non-antibiotic drugs. And so we're asking one at a time, one pair at a time, whether or not we can beat Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Uh, and two, um, uh, 
to our great joy, we discovered, in fact, six um, different combinations um, in, uh, in this particular screen. Five drugs and a vitamin, vitamin C. Um, we have drugs here which are anti-Parkinsonians, um, drugs um, that deal with things like anti-cancer, anti-dandruff. Um, one that we studied in great deal of this, of this group uh, is Imodium, um, which of course is an over-the-counter uh, anti-diarrheal. And so with the success that then on, on uh, Pseudomonas and tetracycline, we've done this sort of screening with many other organisms and, and now using even larger collections of drugs. We've amassed a collection of a couple thousand um, non-antibiotics. And so to return now to MRSA, methicillin-resistant staph aureus, this is the bug we started with um, uh, in the talk uh, this afternoon. We're talking now about an experiment where we have a low dose of a penicillin-like molecule called cefuroxime um, that is otherwise ineffective against methicillin-resistant staph aureus, and combining it now systematically with 2,000 antibiotics. We found that more uh, than a dozen different uh, non-antibiotic drugs could deal with the resistance problems that are inherent um, in MRSA and potentiate the action of cefuroxime, this penicillin-like molecule. Um, but one that was particularly potent um, was ticlopidine. Uh, ticlopidine is an antihypertensive medication that is better known as Ticlid, um, that is taken by uh, patients for, for many years now. Uh, and, um, and it was an exciting find, I think, in this context of trying to beat drug resistance in MRSA. Keep in mind these experiments are all um, petri dish and sort of test tube experiments where we're growing the, the, the cells in the laboratory and asking for these combinations to inhibit growth. We were keen to take this particular combination a little further and see if it would work uh, in an animal model of infection. Uh, and as our animal, we chose the waxworm. Um, it's a fantastic uh, animal model system, actually, in which large numbers of individuals can be tested. Uh, and believe it or not, they have an immune system, an innate immune system, which is not so different from our own and, and very suited um, to testing uh, their ability to survive an acute infection. So on the y-axis here, we're looking at survival of these waxworm uh, uh, individuals over a two-week period after being infected with methicillin-resistant staph aureus. Um, you have uh, a bunch of lines that kind of run below there um, over that two-week course that show um, the mortality among waxworms uh, when they're either un untreated, they're treated with cefuroxime alone, or they're treated with this answer antihypertensive alone. And the red line is when we combine then cefuroxime plus the antihypertensive. So this was exciting stuff for us, and we're, we're hopeful, frankly, that um, one day we might be able to um, see this sort of approach taken in humans, um, much as we like to save the lives of waxwa, waxworms. Pardon me. Uh, just to end here with a quote um, by Joshua Lederberg, um, whose uh, Nobel laureate was, was given his Nobel Prize in his mid-30s um, for work that he did in the area of showing that bacteria can mate and share genes, share resistance genes, in fact. Uh, uh, later, Lederberg lived um, to the age of 83 before he died a few years ago, ironically, of pneumonia. Uh, and he said, the future of humanity and microbes likely will unfold as episodes of a suspense thriller that could be titled Our Wits Versus Their Genes. Uh, this is the group, my research group, that um, largely undergraduates, graduate students, and postdoctoral fellows um, that are spending most of their waking hours um, trying to unwit the genes in bacteria. And I thank you very much for the opportunity today.